After reaching an agreement in principle between the Algonquins of Ontario and the province and the Canadian government, things began to shift and change for the Algonquin land claim. Joining us now for a look at what happened and what's next, Chief Kirby White Duck of the Algonquins of the Pequawkanagon First Nation and Robert J. Potts, Chair of the Aboriginal Law Group at the law firm Blaney McMurtry LLP. And it's a pleasure to have you two gentlemen with us tonight here at TVO. Chief, I'd like to start with you if I can. Uh, the negotiations for this Algonquin land claim, when did they first get underway? Well, the most recent, I guess, uh, effort at negotiations began in 1991, but um, the historical evidence shows that the Algonquins were here at the time of first contact, even with Champlain's journals, shows a meeting a number of Algonquin bands in the, uh, in the Ottawa Valley. So first contact meaning 450 years ago? About, four, well, just over 400, 402, yeah. I believe it is now. Oh, all right. Sorry, you're right. 400, yeah, just over yeah, 400. Yeah. Six, Getting ahead of myself 16, here. 16, 16, 16, 13. Right. And mm -hmm. how many First Nations communities are party to the agreement of principle? Well, at this point, there's uh, 10 Algonquin communities, including the Algonquin and Pequawkanon First Nation in the, uh, in the claim territory uh, as part of a negotiation process. And I guess we're part of the Algonquins of Ontario, uh, including that group. Uh, ten, 10 communities. Let me share with uh, our viewers something you know because it's on your website. It says that the Algonquin traditional territory in Ontario is an area of over 9 million acres, that's 14,000 square miles, within the watersheds of the Ottawa and Mattawa rivers. The area that is the subject of the Algonquin claim in Ontario includes the national capital region, all of Renfrew County, and most of Algonquin Park. Uh, Robert, let me take you, as we take a look at uh, another map that shows some of the 200-plus pieces of land to be transferred to the Algonquins, can you explain to us how 9 million acres of traditional territory became 117,500 acres discussed in the agreement in principle that actually was completed a few years ago? Well, let's uh, start with one thing. Uh, the agreement in principle has been initialed, uh, Steve, so we're not at the point where we can actually say it's a document that uh, is uh, that level of formality. And There's confirming. another step. In initialed yeah. by whom? Uh, initialed by the principal negotiator uh, for the Algonquins of Ontario, which is me, uh, authorized by the Algonquin negotiation representative, mm -hmm. 16 of these representatives from the 10 communities, and the government's uh, representatives, uh, Ron Deering and uh, Brian Crane from Canada and Ontario, respectively. So what we have is a uh, document that is our first step towards the ultimate treaty. Uh, the next step is for us to have a vote on that document, and uh, before we do so, there will be a further level of discussions leading up to that vote. Where do you think things are at right now? I think things are moving forward. Uh, we still have a number of uh, items that we'd like to get clarified within the document, and there's some additional issues that have to be sorted out. But as I say, the next step is in the hands of the Algonquins of Ontario who have to vote. Uh, coming back to your uh, acreage, though, uh, 9 million acres, that represents uh, petitions that were actually filed by the Algonquins uh, following the Royal Proclamation uh, in the latter part of the 18th century and into the early 19th century. So we have petitions that go back where the Algonquins were actually at, endeavoring to get the governments, uh, the government of the day, Britain, to follow up to do a treaty, which is what they did across the country. As you may know, there are a number of treaties, Robinson-Huron, Williams Treaty, and so on. The Algonquins sought a treaty. Um, they had fought for the French. So there was a preliminary issue that might have arisen in terms of their getting a treaty done, but what happened was they then fought for the British in the War of 1812, and of course prior to that, the War of Independence, and they fought valiantly. So there was a lot of pressure to actually respond to them. Uh, petitions arrived, it wasn't like there were texts or emails in those days. They would go to the governor, the governor would study it, and eventually, uh, hopefully, set up a, a process to have a treaty done. It never happened. Um, for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, many of them bureaucratic snafus, perhaps, uh, the governor's being replaced, um, there were uh, maybe a concern about it being a Quebec issue. Anyhow, the bottom line is it never got done, so here we are, uh, you know, 250 years roughly uh, later, trying to find a solution to this very complex problem in a very uh, busy area. Chief, you wanted to add? I think it's important to add that, so the, the draft EAP is initialed, AIP, Agreement in Principle. Yes, it's mm -hmm. initialed by the, the three uh, chief negotiators, but it's, at this point it's not legally binding. And even, if it, even if it does pass a vote, a yes vote, it still won't legally, be legally binding. It's just uh, an indication that the Algonquins find uh, 
the content's acceptable, and then that eventually, will, if, the, if it is acceptable, then there'll be uh, further negotiations towards a final agreement, which will have to then go through the process of, uh, again, another Algonquin vote, then the legislature and parliament for approval under section 3500 of the constitution. So I think it's important to note that. Also, um, as with respect to the land, so it's down to uh, 117,500 acres or so, give a, give a bit more. And that's because we're, like, we're in, in southern Canada and there's a large population in the territory. Uh, I think just over 6 million acres are patented. Uh, and we've, uh, we follow our ancestors' lead not to um, ask for those lands to be returned but to be compensated for them. Also, Algonquin Park and other, other parks make up about uh, 1.4 million acres leaving essentially about 1 million acres outside of those areas as unpatented. And there's a, a, significant, num, num, a, civic, a significant amount of interest, public interest in a lot of those lands that make it difficult for them to be easily transferred to, to the Algonquins. So even though we think there should be more, this seems to be the reality of the, of the area that we're in and, and the time that we're in now uh, of the 20, 21st century. And there has to be some give and take, so that's why uh, we've negotiated at this, mount, at this point. Robert, maybe you could help us with this. The amount of land to be transferred, some of the parcels are as small as two acres, and there are a couple of hundred of them, I think, yes. a couple of hundred different pieces of land. Yes. Why does it make more sense to do it that way as opposed to give one giant piece of land, well, maybe not so giant, but one just you know, contiguous piece of land as opposed to all these different little ones. I think Kirby uh, provided you with a bit of an answer in the front end of that because the interesting thing, Steve, is that we've been at, we've been at this now for, well, the last version is 10 years, 10 years before that as well. This is 250 years in the making, and in that time, that vast area of land has been gradually patented. Uh, it's a, essentially, there's a, an element of colonization that went on here, and as a result, the Algonquins were basically contained in smaller communities over that period of time, and it's a, it's a, it's amazing they were able to survive uh, all that uh, period. Uh, so what we've now done is we've tried to find over a million acres. That's what we've been basically reduced to in terms of crown land selections. Uh, to try and find an adequate land base after it's been picked over for 250 years. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the challenges, especially when you figure there's 86 uh, municipalities, including the nation's capital in the region. There's over a million 200,000 people living there. There's another million, roughly, that come up to recreate both in the summer and the winter. So you can't um, find one big, huge You just chunk. can't easily find one big, right. huge. And, and, and frankly, we have in the sense that approximately 50% of the acreage that we have selected uh, which represents about 60,000 is what is described as nation parks, which are areas that will be uh, used for uh, traditional recreational purposes. Uh, of the other remaining 50%, about 35, or about 30% uh, is used for spiritual um, and uh, cultural and historical sites, and the other roughly um, uh, twenty percent is both uh, for residential and for commercial development. So there's a very real uh, plan that was put into play with the assistance of some very helpful people that advise us as to how we can select these lands. And CFB, uh, Canadian Forces Base Rockcliffe in downtown Ottawa, is part of the mix here. It's part of the mix. Uh, we have come up with a participation agreement with uh, the Canada Lands Company, where we have uh, a certain amount of funds advanced for us so that we can be part of development and either uh, select some uh, lands in different phases and uh, we're in the process now of um, working with uh, another developer to uh, make some selections and uh, uh, a couple of them will be uh, with the Algonquins of Ontario. What's the dollar value on all of this at the end of the day, do you know? Well, it, we're taking it uh, 10 million out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the Financial, Funds, financial uh, yeah, component, yeah, yeah. and uh, I guess we're, it's up to us whether how much of that we want to invest in in the development and what selects will be under different phases. But I mean the whole agreement. In the overall agreement, oh, yeah. it's very hard to uh, it's very hard to give you an exact number. I mean we have three hundred million dollars that will be placed into an interest 
uh, tax-free type of account, which uh, in today's world, as you can imagine, gives you a tremendous advantage in terms of your investment opportunities. And the areas in the land, I mean, no one's taken the time to provide us with an appraisal. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, we're talking areas in the Ottawa Valley. So it's a significant amount of uh, value. Let me follow up with this because, uh, well, I think most fair-minded people want to see justice take place in this circumstances, you know, two and a half centuries in the making, as you've pointed out. Not everybody's thrilled with what's about to transpire. And I'll give you one example, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. There, um, they got a video on their website, a guy named John Winters, former superintendent of Algonquin Park, who has this to say about all of this. Let's roll it, please. I truly believe that the Algonquins of Ontario are deserving of a settlement. They have worked tirelessly and been extremely patient for a very long period of time. And it strikes me that the real question is balance and fairness. So I'm going to state to you this morning that I reread the harvesting chapter this morning for the Algonquin land claim. I read it again this morning. Do you want to know what's been negotiated in terms of fish and wildlife interests in Ontario in that claim so far, in that AIP? Nothing. Chief White Duck, does he have a legitimate concern here? Uh, I don't think so. I think uh, there's been some rules laid out in the, uh, that, that chapter uh, with respect to uh, Supreme Court decisions about how the uh, rights are exercised and what priority they come in. I think what he's, uh, what he's referring to is that there's no specific number saying the Algonquins get this number of moose, this number of fish uh, in these certain locations, but those things will be worked out in uh, management plans uh, post-final uh, agreement. And we'll be working with, uh, with Canada, Ontario, specifically the Minister of Natural Resources, to ensure uh, sustainability, safety, and uh, the exercise of, um, of our Aboriginal rights. What do the anglers and hunters want to see? Well, I think the uh, first, let me just respond to, to, to John. I've got, I know John quite well. I've talked to him numbers of times. And he was the superintendent when we were involved in the initial stages of the claim. What John fails to appreciate is it is an agreement in principle. Meaning? Uh, meaning that it is in principle. There are lots of details that are required to be finalized. It sets a framework for the Algonquins to engage in nation-to-nation -nation discussions with the governments of Canada and Ontario. So it's not the end of the road. It's by no means the end of the road. Is it the middle it, of the road? Well, it's, it's, it's starting down the road, and I'd say we're 25% on the way there. But the real, the real work that is required is the next steps where we engage with people. And when they talk about reconciliation, reconciliation is about respect. And what we've gotten thus far is the first step of that respect, where the Algonquins have finally been acknowledged as having a claim, and there's actually some framework to the resolution of that claim. But when you see the elements of it in there, there are lots of things. The first thing is you have to establish what are the rights of the Algonquins as expressed in a treaty. Mm -hmm. It's taking the Supreme Court of Canada's decisions and trying, as Kirby says, to articulate what that means in relation to ongoing relationships with the governments and others in the territory. This is what the Harvest Chapter does. It sets up a few pieces that are actually more particular. And I think the, the, the version John had read, which was the preliminary draft agreement in principle, never been done before, Stephen. Never in a treaty negotiation has it ever been uh, uh, permitted to have the document put out to the public for their consideration. Never has there been a vote done by the uh, First Nation to determine whether there should be um, a, a draft agreement in principle approved. These are unique steps. So we've actually done things that allowed the public to see what we were doing, quite willing to be in, engaged with them in a discussion in that sense. But at the end of the day, this is a treaty that has to be negotiated government to government, Algonquins to the governments of Canada and Ontario, and ultimately they will engage with their stakeholders to find out what things they need to do vis-a-vis -vis us. Hmm. And they've done it. So some of the things actually that John was complaining about has actually been incorporated into this recent draft of the agreement in principle. There are some things about fishing that are in there. Uh, and John also, I think, would probably be the first to tell you, as he acknowledged, Algonquins of Ontario have actually been engaged in management plans for over 20 years with respect to the harvesting of moose. Unique. Never been done. Where they actually have 
engaged with the uh, Ministry of National Revenue, uh, Natural Resources to make sure that the moose herd in the Algonquin Park and other wildlife ma management units are preserved. So in our last couple of minutes here, Chief, what's, what's next on the road for you in getting this done? Well, next uh, we're going to continue uh, some discussions with uh, the Canadian and provincial negotiation teams and see where we can, um, I guess, tweak some things and maybe uh, get involved in some economic development and maybe flesh out some uh, some projects that may still fit within the current wording of the draft AIP. And then after a period of time, um, we'll probably go ahead and consult the uh, Algonquins and say, here's what we've achieved or not achieved in those discussions. And then the intent then is to see whether we should put it to a vote by the Algonquins at, at that point. So uh, still a few months down the road before we make that kind of um, a decision, I guess, but we intend to uh, consult with the members on any progress made and uh, to educate them so that they can make an informed uh, vote on the uh, AIP if it comes down to that. Here's a follow-up question on Canadian politics. There's an election coming up this October. Yes. You've done a lot of work, obviously, with the current federal government, which is a conservative government. Would it help your efforts to have a change of government? Or are you so far down the road with this group that you want to see it through with this group? Or what's your view? Well, we're not sure if it's going to uh, change would change things because this, this government here is uh, staying with us, staying with us, and uh, continuing with the negotiations. As uh, we've talked about before, is that they have given their uh, negotiated authority to initial EAP, which is an indication then that they're prepared to continue on in the negotiations. And uh, uh, difficult to say whether uh, things would change significantly uh, with a with a new government, uh, possibly. Do you think you have a, de a decent rapport with the current government? Uh, with the negotiation team, we have a pretty good rapport, as well as with uh, talk to the Minister of Indian Affairs a few times about it. So, um, yeah, there is some communication there. When do you think it's going to be all signed, sealed, and delivered? Hard to say, but it could be uh, if we get past the, uh, the EIP vote. Could be two years, could be five years. Um, Nothing happens fast, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very complicated process, and uh, most claims seem to take about 20, maybe 30 years in some cases, eh? So right. it's a lot of time and effort and energy. Uh, and a lot of people is part, uh, a good part of their lives. Indeed. Yes. Chief White Duck, it's good of you to join us here tonight on TVO. Robert Potts from Blaney McMurtry, thank you for joining us as well. Our thank pleasure. you, Steve. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.